they went on this Goldilocks journey through these models at a, at a fairly involved level because once once you get there, there's no getting the toothpaste back into the tube. You know, uh, it, it, magic becomes, especially from a chaos magic perspective, it becomes a lot easier to perform in a practical enchantment sense because you're not you're not fighting uh, this very flimsy but dominant monocultural assumption. So, and, and you know, this is kind of what we used to do. Uh, certainly in the classical age, uh, if you look at great chunks of the sort of grimoire tradition timeline, that ran through monasteries and, uh, and ecclesiastical schools where they learnt uh, Plato and they learnt Aristotle and they actually engage with the, the philosophical and metaphysical ideas. Oh my God, yes. I mean, the, the very fathers of Western esotericism were the ones translating Plato and consumed by the arguments of the one and being. Yeah, absolutely. But even even outside the kind of the rain shadow of, of Florence, you have, um, you know, Trithemius was a monk, I'm pretty sure. If mm -hmm. not, he, he went to a seminary. So even the guys who are out there with the quote unquote bad books, they're in, they're in monasteries. They're, they're, they're part of the church infrastructure. And, and to be part of that church infrastructure, you've gone through that church training. You've gone through uh, Augustinian philosophical schools and you know how to think about creation in a metaphysical capacity. And, and you land on an informed opinion if you you know if you don't want to get burned alive you land on the approved opinion but nevertheless a lot of them from from a metaphysical perspective certainly if if you head east rather than to rome from a metaphysical perspective a lot of them are quite sound and we don't do any of that uh, we no. don't do any of that at all uh, the kind of last gasp of it was in fact the middle class victorian magicians of the of the 1890s renaissance 1880s renaissance mm. and only because so many of them went to uh public schools and and kind of well crowley dropped out of ivy league but you, but you have people who studied classics exactly. when schools still taught classics right so they got a light hand they got a light version of it and this is the piece this is kind of at the bottom of the jenga stack and it's something that we uh, you know, we can blame culture and say our culture has failed us, uh, and, and in some respects it has. But by the same token, we failed ourselves because, as I was just saying to Jason Miller last night, as a matter of fact, these books, like the complete works of Plato, are available on your phone for free. There is no excuse. <laughs> There's no excuse, and I'm not just I'm just p uh, plucking Plato out of the air, the Platonic form of Plato. Uh, you can find these things, and these were the ideas that allowed magicians to think about things like what is a spirit and um, how might sorcery work and, and where does where does a human fit in these these things. And they don't necessarily need to be right. You, you come through the end of reading and thinking about it better because you've you've gone through that exercise of, of, of thinking about it, which which we don't. And um, honestly, materialism falls away like cake in, a ra in the rain. And once that happens, you're kind of three quarters of the way to performing magic even before you step into the circle. Wow. I can't, I can't really echo what you said any louder. I mean, the, all of those opinions I completely agree with. Um, the emphasis on the classics, learning philosophy, uh, having a f firm foundation in those subjects. I mean, you're right. Uh, in order to practice magic, uh, if that's really, really the best place to begin if you have the time and the, the energy, because that's, that's going to provide a level of sophistication that you just can't get in magic how-to books. Or you'll spend less time arguing on Facebook as well. <laughs> that's always good. Because if you look at the quality of metaphysical speculation in in the modern magical world it's it's not very good uh, and when i say the modern magical world obviously we have to do the caveat thing as I, i'm talking about western european magic and its subsets mm -hmm. because you know you if you go to china or somewhere they're they know they're as dumb as us when it comes to that kind of thing and they they have a bit more of an understanding of their own kind of philosophical backgrounds as a generalization 
And you look at it and, and, and people arguing, you know, classic ones like the psychological model versus the spirit model. And people, I, I hesitate to say they solved it, but people smarter than you and I, Greg, were thinking about this in the 300s. Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> this is not a new... Yeah, before, page, there was in, before there was indoor plumbing, they had figured this out. Yeah, and they and they 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 develop ways of thinking about it and contextualizing it, and so uh, for me, it, it, this is where it comes back to the chaos magic thing. There's an expediency to it, which is well, do I need to do I need to spend 15 years arguing with people I don't know on the internet about things that aren't ever going to move the discourse forward until they incorporate some of these ideas? And the answer to that is no. And and so for me, um, for step one is materialism, and I think the cleanest and and sort of shortest way of doing that is looking at um, psi results and 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 paranormal, you know, data. But once you've done that, you're you're kind of in this world where all these things happen. Um, and I mean, I talked to Dr. Kripal about this because I, I think you know, phenomenology is as close as a modern school can get to saying the A word animism without actually doing it. But you're, once you start to absorb, once you are forced to absorb non-materialist data points, you have to go on this quest. And my recommendation is this quest, well, and obviously yours, Greg, my recommendation is this quest should take you through uh, classical modes of thinking. You don't have to stay in them. I'm not trying to turn anyone into a Platonist. I'm not even really a Platonist or any of that stuff, uh, but you have to go through the journey. And that, that that just seems like there's an opportunity there that few people take up because they want to know why their candle magic spell isn't working. And it's a – and funnily enough, my prescription in that case would be just what we described as well. I, like I, I, the candle – if the candle is lit, the candle is working. So you're going to have to look elsewhere for the leak. Mm. That's a good rate one. <laughs> wow, I could I could spend all night talking about this, but um, let's see. What is uh, quantum abuse, and what are the advantages and disadvantages of connecting traditional magical concepts to modern science? Yeah, so um, quantum abuse is is twofold. The first one is it became kind of faddish, uh, all all the the kind of shyster way of pretending you've done what we've just discussed is to put the word quantum in front of something. Now, some things can be quantum. I mean, I, I think quantum effects scale up, uh, and I think that there's, there is a way of modeling how a lot of things like telepathy work by, by, by thinking about that. But that tends to be not what people do, and, and that's step one of quantum abuse. Uh, if you want to get interested in the kind of edge of physics that's, you know, highly encouraged, but just dropping the word in front of it. And the other one is when people do this or when you most commonly see uh, quantum effects or quantum theory invoked in a magical environment, they're invoking the wrong thing. They're invoking the wrong implication. It's the, the many worlds hypothesis, which is an egregious violation of Occam's razor, which suggests that, uh, to sort of solve the the, the wave particle duality that um, at each point an entire universe splits so that the particle is still a particle and it can't ever not be. So it's what they do is at every you know microsecond everywhere in the universe where these um, you know when this duality happens an entire universe is created. So in order to save materialism in order to prevent the idea that we have to move the official discourse to say that there are some things that exist non-materially that there are aspects of the universe probably the majority of it that exist in a probabilistic uh non-physical state people have this many worlds hypothesis and we just kind of ape it because we think it's like that um that movie sliding doors and that's not at all what it means like uh the many worlds hypothesis does not mean there are other dimensions. There are other ways to model that, and there, there probably are. The many worlds hypothesis is, is specifically an absurd and childlike and completely unscientific because it's unfalsifiable guess and, and a hope that you don't notice because they've thrown in a whole bunch of science words. 
that they're trying to defend materialism in the face of evidence that breaks it. Hmm. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, yeah, I like uh, I like rounding on materialism wherever possible. But I live in I live in a city where a lot of people read the Guardian, so uh, I've gotten good at it. Yeah, I bet. Um, so do you see advantages and disadvantages of sort of connecting magical concepts to modern scientific ideas? Yeah, this goes back to the metaphysics thing we were talking about. Uh, in both cases, you're dealing with the proverbial finger pointing at the moon rather than the moon. Mm. When we when we argue about what is a spirit, it's the same like, is it psychological? It is in your head. The, the very first ontological question in the universe has not been satisfactorily answered. So, yes, I do think there's value in it as long as it is done in such a way that you, you're building a metaphysics rather than seeking to explain one with the other. Oh, They're yeah. not, they don't go sideways. Uh, and I, And that's one of the things that keeps me interested in magic and, and science and, and fringe science and ufology in an ongoing basis because there are data points out there that invite modeling and I, I'm fairly omnivorous or dare I say promiscuous in where I can get this information from. And so, yes, I do think there's value in it, but it's not because you're looking for an explanation. You're not trying to find how – you're not trying to go, ah, oh, look at me. I solved how magic works. Money, please. Uh, it's not uh, – that's not the goal. The goal is to make your universe bigger and with more question marks in it, especially once you've dispatched materialism. And then you are you are living in, in, in the sorcerer spirit world. Yeah. I like how you, you put that sort of like to using science to kind of inform your metaphysics. I think that's a much better way of approaching it. Well, yeah, because you get caught in an infinite loop because otherwise you get caught in the Arthur C. Clarke loop, which is you can explain science with magic and magic with science and you still explain nothing. Right. Right. Yeah. I think I think that a good illustration of that might be, you know, the whole idea of science trying to explain exactly the mechanism of life itself. And it gets to a certain point and it just can't make that leap. No, and its metaphysics and its worldview is, is so – well, the official materialist reality worldview is so poorly suited to the task that it either um, pretends it doesn't exist, which it does with consciousness, or just hopes you don't notice. And we can fall into a variant of that trap, mm -hmm. and that reduces your effectiveness as a magician. So – you're kind of in an ongoing state of modeling and remodeling your own metaphysics, or at least you should be. And it's fun. I know we've, people have, if people haven't really found their own parts of science that interest them, it's because, and quite rightly, um, you know, they, they have horrific memories of high school. And, and science education is, is designed to make you extremely disinterested in science. And, and if that, you know, if that was a, a, an actual plan, then they have succeeded. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately. Exactly. Yeah. I, I mean, these are, these are interesting ideas. Um, you know, sort of going back to more classical ways of learning that, uh, we are forced to revisit now that we're older. Yeah, it's interesting in the last few years how the the kind of creepy neighbor sheen has completely gone from homeschooling to the point where uh, if I had kids in probably half the countries in the West, I would be investigating how I could homeschool them. You're right. <laughs> you just look at it in the medium term and go, what? What? That, that's not even learning. And yeah, uh, so the, that's the bad news. The good news is, as we said before, this information has never been available to more people at lower cost in all of history. Yeah. So it's it's a glass half full situation. Yeah. Let's let's take advantage of it. So how would you define what you say is quote true unquote initiation? And what do you mean by becoming invincible? So for me, there are a number of challenges with how we see initiation in Western esotericism today. 
And it's most 